All right, you want to take it away? So, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Bridget. I'm a rising sophomore CS major and I'm interning here. And I'm Victor, uh, also a CS major, but a rising senior. Uh, unfortunately, Payan won't be with us today, but um, just want to give credit for a lot of the charts he made and observable, especially finding a lot of the popular tools. Uh, so a lot of the charts you see would be uh, made by him on observable. Uh, first, just going to go over some of the goals uh, for the internship we have. Uh, so the main goal would be to determine the approximate cost on cloud-based resource jobs. Uh, just see um, how much uh, resources are used and then uh, compare that to how popular the tool is. And also they'll give a more better picture of which Galaxy tools are most popular. And then, um, like I said, some jobs such as upload are extremely popular, but uh, consume very little resources. Uh, while others such as um, BWA MIM and other uh, high resource jobs uh, use a lot of memory or CPU. Uh, would use a lot of resources, but are uh, not as used or not as common. And then once we get some benchmarks, for those we'll be able to visualize and predict uh, about how much each tool consume uh, based on the results get from all the benchmarks. And that should give a good idea of the approximate cost per job, um, depending on the CPU and memory allocation. So uh, the way that we go about collecting this benchmarking data is we've used three uh, different cloud instances. So Jetstream, Google Cloud or GCP and Amazon or AWS. Uh, we collected several DNA and RNA data sets, uh, both paired and single reads to test a variety of data on a, a suite of tools. So uh, we used workflows to run these benchmark tests um, through tools uh, running these DNA and RNA data sets through tools like BWA, BWA MEM, Bowtie 2, HiSat 2, String Tie, Salmon, and Callisto, uh, because those seem to be relatively common tools that we would get some benefit from figuring out run times of. And uh, lately, we've been using BioBlend to uh, speed up this process on uh, different instances because that allows us to run multiple. Uh, workflow benchmarking tests at the same time, which is really nice. Victor, you're muted. Uh, so this would be the DNA data set benchmark uh, workflow. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have an input, which is a FASTQ data set. And then we'll combine that to each of the tools we want to run. Uh, so in this case, we have five tools. So we have Bowtie 2, BWA MEM, BWA High Set 2, and String Tie. Uh, in this case, we decided to link String Tie to High Set 2 because this would be the most consistent job. Uh, so it never failed. And then, uh, furthermore, uh, with those work the uh, workflows, we're we'll able to grab ID. And then uh, in BioBlend, we could use that ID for the workflow and then uh, generate the benchmarks automatically for a certain allocation. For the RNA data sets, uh, we had to have two inputs because Salmon and Callisto required a reference transcriptome. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we're also testing Bowtie 2 and BWMM on that one. And we linked String Tie to Bowtie 2 because, again, that one was the most consistent running uh, tool in that workflow. So we'd always get the String Tie to run. <laughs> uh, so here is just a, a quick look at some of the data we have on this Google spreadsheet. Uh, so we'll take a look right now. Uh, so what we did at first is we just put uh, all the data into the spreadsheet. So we'll have like, uh, the link to the job. Uh, and you can also look for the job ID and the data sample, as well as the CPU allocation, like this. And we'll just input them uh, with the link here and then the history ID. 
Uh, in the future, though, we plan to move all of this to observable uh, because it'll be uh, much easier to um, look up all the data there. Uh, because once you start having multiple runs, so let's say like you know three or four runs uh, per instance, uh, it's going to be a little bit clustered on the spreadsheet. So it'll be much nicer and also more um, compressed on observable. So all the other data will be there as well. Uh, next, Bridget will go over some of the observable data we have, including some of the plots. So I'll uh, have her share her screen now. All right, so this is our observable uh, dashboard. Uh, Dannon has the main version, so we're on his page and it's updated. Um, so these are uh, some stacked area charts of historical data, which Paywon uh, collected the data for and made these graphs. So shout out Paywon, thank you. Uh, so you can uh, look at uh, which tool is represented by which area because of tool tips. So they just pop up as you mouse over them. So as you can see, upload is quite popular. Uh, so it's it's at the bottom and it has the most area. And then there are things like, uh, I don't know, there's there should be BWMM in here. Uh, probably more interesting in terms of resource consumption is total CPU time per month. Uh, for some reason, Top Hat 2 is a large uh, resource consumer, which is strange because it's uh, deprecated. Uh, but also you can see BWMM and uh, Bowtie 2 and other common tools like that that we're testing. Uh, these two are kind of... Sorry, what is green on that chart? Uh, I think that's RNA star. Yeah, it is. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, average memory consumption per month by tool and average CPU time per month by tool are kind of uh, not super readable. <laughs> for some reason, but yeah. Um, and then these are tables that go with those uh, those stacked area charts so that you can look at the specific numbers and organize, you know, sort however you want. Uh, and then here are some uh, tables for comparisons. So number of jobs versus number of users, number of jobs versus total CPU and number of jobs versus total memory. Uh, now we get to some, some new stuff that wasn't here on Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just made these yesterday. So uh, there's uh, tables and plots for uh, all three instances benchmarking data so far. So uh, this is a filterable plot and a table below. Uh, I can demonstrate. So if you put in bow tie, uh, you can see all the bow tie runs and you can also mouse over with tooltip and see like more detailed information like the CPU count and the uh, memory and also the specific system runtime and real runtime. Uh, you can also look up uh, like memory usage. So for this one, I think 50 would probably, yeah. So for uh, the 16 CPU and 50 mem, uh, you can see all of the runs of all the tools with that resource setting on them. Nice, nicely enough, because of uh, graphing system runtime versus real runtime, they seem to form lines. So even if you don't have a filter on, you can kind of tell which resource tier uh, you're looking at. So uh, yeah, and when you type in this bar, it also filters the table. So you can do two at the same time. We so, have the same, yeah. Can you go back to that plot? So I want to um, unpack what you just said there. So it makes these like lines and you said that corresponds to the configuration, but the configuration of what? Uh, of what what uh, resources we were running on the cluster when we ran these benchmarking tests. It's like the number of cores or the amount of RAM. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is it is it is there an easy way to kind of say what those lines are just very quickly? Uh yeah, I'm. It's it's just like kind of an interesting feature that happened when I graphed it. Um, no, but like that one specifically. Is that like the four core eight gig line? Uh yeah, this this one is right here. Yeah. And the, and then what's the one above that? Uh, it should be nine and twenty-eight. Yeah, nine CPU, twenty-eight mem. I see, and it, and it's nine because I think it was a ten-core machine, but you reserve one core for the GUI and other kind of scheduling tests. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So what's interesting is like to compare like the the same dot. So here, like I mean, it's still work in progress, but like the, the top rightmost dot. Is likely to be comparison of you know, the same tool 
So that one's four and eight runs, whatever, 9,000 uh, seconds. And if you move over to the, the middle one, top one, it's going to be probably the same tool, but you have more CPU. So it's like that, that's the, if that is linear, that means the tool speed up is linear across the, across the CPUs. But again, that's we'll figure out more visualizations, but it, and that's the way to compare what the, the impact CPU configuration changes have on the runtime of a tool at this point. I see. Well, you could do the filtering. You could do you know bow tie and see all the bow tie runs. Yeah, yeah, but, but you want to compare the lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's so cool. Thank you. Yeah. Also, there is a you can zoom in and out a little bit because uh, Paywan and Dan and worked on that. So I just. I used their their plots down at the bottom here, which I'll get to in a sec uh, for a template. So that helped a lot. <laughs> so yeah, and we also have AWS and GCP, same thing. Uh, you can filter them all. So, uh, and the, the hope is to overlay these at some point, or at least make it so that we can have like them all in the same space and select to switch between them rather than scrolling. So hopefully I'll, you know, can implement that soon. Do you know if the, um, I guess, processor architecture and clock speeds are comparable across GCP and Jetstream and AWS? Uh, probably I, I don't know how to answer that one. We'll probably have to overlay that to um, see if the system runtime are, uh, you know, com comparable across all these platforms. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that that'll be in the documentation to some degree of the you know, respective providers, but we have we, we use the same machine class like memory. They have CPU heavy ones and the memory heavy ones and whatever. So it's the same class across the the providers, but I uh, have not looked at the like the CPU specs for each yet. Okay. Yeah. So just to wrap up, uh, we, we draw our, all of our data from uh, GitHub. So it just links right in. So that's nice. We don't have to upload any files. And here was the, the testing of, of zooming down below. And here's a, a scatter plot of the number of jobs versus total memory and uh, number of jobs versus CPU time, like the charts, the tables up, up above. So yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what we have on here so far. We're planning on adding a table of contents for better navigation. And uh, like I said, the, the overlaying or the at least quickly switching between the instances benchmarking data charts. So that should be coming soon. And I think the plan, I mean, it's great that this is available, but I think the plan is to sort of embed some of these figures onto Galaxy Hub. Yeah. Yeah, eventually we will be uh, incorporating all this into an API. So, well, there's you know there's the API, but then there's also make, just sort of making it easier to find rather than having to know to go to Dannon's like private repo here. Yeah, <laughs> this is so cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So, there you go. Uh, so like we mentioned earlier, uh, we just went over the observable as on the graph here. Uh, so hopefully in the future, uh, one will be able to overlay them. And also uh, once you have more benchmarks on uh, the same instance and on the same data set, so multiple um, reruns, we'll hopefully get an average system runtime and then compare uh, the plots for those uh, across each data set we use instead of um, each uh, job. And hopefully we'll see something, um, see if it's linear uh, acceleration or not, like Zenin said. Uh, so we did have a few challenges. Uh, one of the main challenges was trying to get polyester to run. Uh, so polyester would be able to create synthetic RNA data sets to use. And then with those, we'll be able to run those synthetic data sets on the tools uh, to see uh, if the results are any different from any of the real life RNA data. Uh, also, um, one issue just resolved earlier uh, when Keith uh, added a new node for GCP. So we now have a 32 gigabyte node. So we should be able to do the 29 gigabyte uh, so larger research resources on GCP. Uh, the main issue right now is uh, I'm having some issues with creating new histories or starting jobs. So hopefully that gets fixed soon. 
Uh, and then uh, also uh, having some issues with RNA star and arsen, uh, mainly due to memory allocation issues, as well as uh, some of these need extra references to run. So in the future, hopefully uh, we'll be get polyester and uh, also run all these other tools, uh, as well as a uh, high set two for RNA in a short while as well. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with the help of Keith's BioBlend scripts, uh, benchmarking is going, going forward on different instances. If we decide to add more of them, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, we have configuration files written for RNA and DNA data set benchmarking. So uh, we just modify those and uh, run them. And it's a lot quicker. Uh, and uh, one issue with this going forward, though, is that data set and workflow IDs change across cloud platforms. So Keith is currently making progress on uh, identification by name instead of ID for BioBlend. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that working if we before we add another instance to our benchmarking. So that's exciting. Uh, and we're also aiming to extract names and data set type info from Galaxy for uh, the observable plots and tables, because uh, as, as it stands right now, we can't tell uh, which dots are uh, DNA or RNA or paired or unpaired or how many gigabytes of storage they take up. So we can't really drill down like which trials are which, basically. So we're trying to get that information available in the charts. Um, and then finally, the, the end goal of this is using this benchmarking data. We're trying to implement an API and hopefully incorporate it into the Galaxy interface to uh, provide access to cloud cost information. So, yep. Uh, thank you, are there any questions? Yeah. Yes, the, this API, what would it return? What's the, how would it work? Uh, so you would uh, be able to select a job and then also maybe select the approximate data set size. And then depending on the allocation of the CPU and memory, they'll be able to return approximate runtime uh, based off, uh, you know, some of the benchmarks we'll be doing. So we'll be able to get a general idea of maybe like the average system runtime once we get those benchmarks down. And then they'll use that as a reference to give you uh, the user uh, approximate runtime for their job they're running. I mean, that's kind of the holy grail though. So I can, uh, I can share something as well that uh, what we've been working on a bit. Um, that's, one sec. Yeah. Um, John, can you uh, add me to the share list? I think everyone should be able to share. Um, oh, uh, sorry, um, Victor, if you, you, you got to stop first. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so this is what, uh, what we had sort of started talking about uh, as a schema for what the API would return. So we have a, uh, a list of tools that have been registered uh, in here. And then the metrics that uh, have been captured for the tool. So it gives you, you know, most, the, the significantly the number of CPUs, memory, and the, the run times, along with uh, the inputs that were used to derive that benchmark result. Um, and then uh, we have sort of a database of inputs that we've tested with that's available as an endpoint. And then, uh, or oh, sorry, those are for uh, for posting. These are for, uh, um, for, yeah, so you can get a, a list of tools, the metrics for the tool, and then the inputs. And so if, one idea was that uh, before you hit the execute button in Galaxy, you you could have uh, you know estimate or give me some examples um, button next to it that you click would create this API and return um, an extrapolation of the available benchmarking data combined with the data that the user has provided on the input form, but that's way down the line. But yeah, I mean. I can post this in, in the chat and if there are comments as to what this API might look like, because it'd be great to have the consuming end using it as much as the, the building out end to begin with. So currently is all this just treating each individual version of a tool as a separate entity? And so 
you're not able to necessarily compare between versions. And is that the same for the, the metrics? So if, you know, if there's like 10 different versions of BWA, for example, right? is BWA going to be listed 10 different times? Was a role in the notebook? Yeah, I mean, as it stands, yeah, we didn't aggregate across the versions. Uh, I don't know whether we should have or not, but we didn't. Um, have you guys considered um, incorporating uh, Galactic Radio Telescope? data so that um, in addition to benchmarks, you know, of, of just like sort of stock data sets, you can get a picture from all over, uh, you know, random data and, and um, different configurations of production yeah. servers and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's certainly an option, but uh, I mean, this was, we had six weeks uh, and the state of radio telescope was kind of in flux. So um, plus, it, as you said, it's it's random data as opposed to sort of controlled inputs. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's on the table, certainly. Um, just uh, with the timeline we had, the radio telescope seemed to be out of scope for to, to actually get info. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I, I really, it, it's good because the past projects that have focused on this, we're, we're using the that kind of data, right? Like the, the existing ones. I like the the approach here of like, I mean, if, you, if you're changing these variables intentionally, there's more things you can sort of um, pull out of the, tease out of the data, I think. It would be really great if like, uh, I'm, I know these summer projects are, are, are short term and, and stuff. It would be really, one cool outcome might be just like a list of issues on some galaxy project galaxy um on the on the board on the issue board just like here are the things that we could do to sort of improve the apis make it easier to sort of do this next time um but th yeah that in documentation but, uh is really nice I, I mean i guess in that vein is there is are there things that that that, that galaxy the framework or galaxy the ui or the api could do to, to sort of make this process easier You might have some comments on that one. Yeah, I've talked to Keith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the the issue with uh, uh, trying to determine um, the IDs of data sets when we move them across issues. Uh, but John and I have already been talking about that in Gitter, and I had some ideas this morning. Uh, still trying to determine if the problems I'm encountering are, you know, a problem in Galaxy or a problem with BioBlend. Uh, so I'm just trying to see if I can pull the information straight out of the database uh, to see what's in there. Um, and I'll have some questions uh, about that for John and get her probably later today. But otherwise, I, you know, like, Make this uh, well, it's only for the benchmarking, but um, being able to keep a consistent set of IDs across instances. I know Nate has a trick where you set the secret to a known variable or something, and you, I don't know how far that goes. Like, I think the first data set you can predict, I don't know if you can go further, but like, if there was a way to like force same IDs of resources as you upload them. Um, what UUIDs should be for? Yeah, I mean, Kyle did some work around UUIDs. I mean, data sets have UUIDs. I don't know if it's if it's useful in this context, though. And and then the APIs that can consume them are kind of sporadic. Um, but if we could have like a consistent uh, approach of using UUIDs, I think that was the idea there. So would those be the same across instances? Like, if you, I mean, how would that? Um, if you code uploaded code. them, if you uploaded them with a specific UUID, they would okay. be right. So if you scripted this out, and I believe the upload, uh, let me think. Well, maybe I. Yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking of hashes. We we we, we could you you can tell the upload to like hash the data set, um, but we can't do much with that in terms of searching after the fact. Yeah, I don't know. I think the upload tool lets you specify the UUID during upload. I don't think it's in the GUI, but. Um... That'd be cool. Yeah, okay, we can look at that. That's uh, useful for that. Ennis, what is the backend for that API that you just showed? Will that be part of every Galaxy instance or? 
So uh, this would be an independent app. There's no back end to this. This is just um, uh, a swagger spec in OpenAPI. And so Pay1 is starting to look at uh, implementing this in Django as, a, as an app. So we'd run this somewhere, right? I, I don't. I, I don't believe uh, adding more features into the Galaxy core base that are not related to Galaxy is the right architectural path forward. So I think decoupling things are uh, is better. We can update independently and such. I agree. I was just interested where what your what your vision was there. But I think we have the scripts in place now that we could you know do this. Um, profiling of usage on main quite regularly, right? You know, it almost turn into a crown job that runs, I don't know, once a week or once a month or whenever we want it. That'd be, that'd be cool. And then- That'd be nice to, to monitor for you know, abnormalities and like if the infrastructure is not behaving as expected and also you have some kind of deviation from the average and see whether things are running so that they could aid in service stability testings, for example, too, not just benchmarking. Yeah. Well, kind of like how Anton noticed there was that expansion on STAR. You know, if you kind of squint at those charts, you can see where, you know, COVID was very popular and protein folding was very popular and RNA-seq was very popular. It's kind of fun to watch over time. Yeah. Well, you mean historic data? Like historic data, yeah. Historic data, yeah, 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 that'd be, that'd be. That'd be great if we, I mean, I, I think overall, if we could drive more of our development decisions based on user usage, it would it would really point us um, to what people are doing uh, as opposed to what we think. Uh, I think we can already do that because the fact that top head is still there is disturbing and it's uh, clearly uh, uses resources that we need elsewhere. So mm -hmm. get rid of top head. Very clear message. Nate, can we do that, please? Good boss, you tell me to remove it and it's gone. We just put more warning text at the top saying, hey, you probably don't want to use this. <laughs> I don't know. Well, but yeah, can I, I can also send it to, to things like Stampede where it won't run for two days and then maybe people will stop using it, but. Yeah. How much data, database massaging was necessary to generate these graphs for historic data? Not much. I mean, it, uh, it, we, we pulled out the uh, certain fields from predominantly the jobs table, jobs in the metrics tables, uh, and selected the fields that did not include inputs um, or, you know, they were also that, that shrunk the size of those. So the querying works reasonably fast. But uh, I mean, the queries are in in that usage uh, metering repo on GitHub. Um, I think in the README even. So the queries did run for a while, but other than that, it was not not complicated. Because what what I'm thinking is that if we can run these some queries which produce kind of de-identified data regularly, put it somewhere, and then anyone can start observable, pull this in and visualize, that would be, that would kind of solve our, solve our reporting problems. Uh, example. I, think, I mean, there was, there was some yeah. interest among uh, 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 public admins of re, re, uh, resurrecting the telescope to do exactly that. So, uh, you know, I kind of wonder if we should combine efforts on this. Um, to come up with the best possible thing, because I think there is a lot of interest in doing that. Um, I think that would be that would be wonderful, because I mean the benchmarks that are done now are amazing and are very interesting, but it's you know a dozen tools out of what ten thousand or so. The only way we're going to have a broad analysis is mining you know the runs that are going on anyway. But I, I do appreciate you know there are sensitivities around that, so we got to do it in a very sort of um, uh, transparent and sort of iterative approach so everyone's comfortable with it. In the very least, we, we should be talking to make sure that we're using the same fields or what fields are going to be useful for the database. Yeah. 
And then ultimately, I mean, here we're measuring runtime and, and so forth, but in a cloud environment, we're measuring dollars too. <laughs> so I think we're gonna be the heroes of genomics if we can put a dollar amount on these popular pipelines. Cause you know, when you're times 10,000 samples, you know, it starts to be real money on the table. And it'd be cool even at the end of running a workflow if it tells you how much you would have spent if you were paying for it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that could be fun at, you know, especially at TAC, where it's all free. It'd be kind of fun to say, had you done this at GCP, this would have cost, you know, whatever it was, $15,000. <laughs> TAC would love that. That would be, yeah, that'd be amazing. I'd love that as well. Especially if you could have like a running tab. Show people how much we're giving them. Because <laughs> if you see one job, it's like, yeah, you know, it's 12, two, 2 cents or 12 cents or whatever. But if you see over the course of a month that, that you've consumed, you know, 500 or $1,000 or Five thousand dollars worth of compute. That's an impactful resource. So um, once once the internship is over, how do we continue? Well, the great news is that uh, they've all um, expressed interest in carrying on, uh, albeit at, at lower uh, engagement levels, but. Um, Yeah, this is just the beginning. Now, I'm wondering if the uh, top four tools in terms of CPU usage have a GPU version available that we can utilize to free up the CPU possibly. I'm not aware of a good version of Top Hat to um, a GPU, but you know, as we mentioned, there are newer tools like HiSat that are basically drop-in replacements in an order of magnitude faster. It also, you know, to me, like the, the fact that almost I don't know, it almost feels like twenty percent of all jobs are upload jobs is. You know, they don't represent 20% of the resources consumed, but um, it, it seems like from the user's perspective, if we could streamline the upload process, if we could allow remote data, what Jeremy keeps saying, to be just linked, it would have a massive impact. I mean, that's one out of every five jobs that runs on main uh, is, is an upload job. So focusing on solving that to make that seamless, faster, less resource intensive, I think that the users will really appreciate Uh, I think we have something similar really in like the uh, personal histories where you could kind of drag the data sets into a new history. Uh, is that what you mean by streamlining it a little bit? So could we use some of the uh, previously uploaded data that you need to use? I mean, if, yeah, like sharing it between users or sharing it across Galaxy instances. Um, if the, you know, if you go, there's multiple of these. So we're using usegalaxy.org, but there's .eu, .au, and, and many others. Um, if, those data sets were uploaded once and if users swap between instances, they were able to re reuse the data sets without having to re-upload the data, the, the data. That's one. Secondly, oftentimes and increasingly so, um, particularly the public data sets already live somewhere not on the lap on the user's laptop. And so instead of having to go through the task of you know, explicitly uploading, waiting for that upload and running the metadata, if you could just say the file is in this S3 bucket, and, and then when a job runs, uh, it downloads the file for the purposes of that particular job, but the upload step can be skipped altogether from the user perspective. You don't have to wait that extra, whatever, 15 minutes, an hour, depending on the size and your bandwidth. And then in terms of user experience, just to throw it out an idea, if you could like drag and drop a file from your desktop onto the upload button, and then it just magically <laughs> brought it in it would probably save you know a gazillion clicks over time so there's probably some relatively simple things that could be done there so you can already drag a file into the upload form box but adding that um, action event action to the button itself yeah, as well as right. but you open the box you just drag stuff in. Ah, okay cool I mean, it also kind of, it was kind of an interesting comment on the nature of genomics. You know, if, if one in five are uploads, 
and you know, I mean, there's a lot of caveats, but in round numbers, most workflows are only like four or five steps long from a given data set. Um, it's just kind of, it's kind of interesting that it's relatively shallow. But I, I guess that's sort of compatible with my life experiences. Often it's kind of a few steps per data set. You know, obviously there's exceptions and some go on very deep, but those are rare, relatively rare. I think this is also an indication why we need to focus on UI more because it's also probably UI limitations that they just give up at some point. It's maybe part of it, but I just think just the state of the field is, you know, upload, do some QC, do a map, do variant call, do some comparison, done. It'd be nice to, to also add the download rate of downloads because I mean do people just stop or do they pull it out of galaxy and take it elsewhere is another question that can be asked and at that five point step. It's a good question. Uh, actually and it's just the idea uh you brought up earlier like you know um sharing data across instances. Uh maybe if you could somehow have a way to like you have like two separate tabs on screen. And then one is like the maybe the uh, the regular instance, and one is like an EU instance or something. Like maybe like drag the data set from the um, EU instance, and then drag it across the tab into the uh, the regular instance, and somehow share the data that way. I'm not sure if it's possible, um, but yeah, I mean that that's the, the the back end is the challenge there um, in how Galaxy stores references to the data sets or metadata. But yeah, that that's the idea. I think just um, the implementation is the sticky point. All right. Um, awesome. Any other questions or comment points or? Uh, I guess one more thing, just following up on the other one. Uh, I think it might be possible because um, you know how each data set has a link attached to it, like in the history? And then you can actually copy that link and then uh, on another instance and then um, upload it that way. So it might be um, possible to do it like, you know, like, like that instead of um, directly copying over, just um, having the link copied over when you drag it over or something and then uploading it automatically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's the nuances there, but yeah. Yeah, you, you want the like metadata to be the same, right? So you, if the user had selected a special extension for that file or something, you wouldn't want to just sort of take the link and re-import it. You'd want to capture some of that metadata, but I'm, I'm not sure how the uh, APIs on the client work for dragging and dropping between browsers, but if, if we could sort of capture more of that metadata. Um, yeah, I mean, that'd be very cool. All right. I guess we'll uh, end the meeting a little bit early. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for interns. <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're sticking around. That's great. Um, have a good school year. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor and Bridget. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you guys.